Hey guys, good morning. Hope everybody is doing okay this morning. I'm coming to you for our second day of 21 days of morning prayer. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being part of this project. This morning I'm going to do a tutorial, a how-to on how to do daily morning prayer right to and I just want to walk you through how you could do it at your home like I am today. When you do morning prayer, at least when I do morning prayer at home, I don't really do it like we would do it in worship like Gail and I did it yesterday. Um, I make it a little more efficient, uh, skip a couple things here and there, and you're free to do your own version of it, but I wanted to walk you through how I do daily morning prayer when I do it and uh, the way that you might, like I said, uh, you might do it at home. Okay, you'll need two things for when you do your morning prayer. You, you will need a Book of Common Prayer, right here, and a Bible. Now you wanna do some preparation before you dive right in. You wanna find in the back of your Book of Common Prayer, You'll find at the very back the Daily Office Lectionary. Now I could talk about what that is and what that came from, but that's for a different video. So basically every day of the year has some biblical passages that are assigned to it. And you can go through most of the Bible if you use this lectionary for your daily prayers. It's on a two-year cycle, and we are in year two, and it follows the liturgical year. So if you turn to page 955, 955, you'll see week three of Lent over on the year two side. And then you'll see Monday on, on top of that. Monday, Lent three. And then you're going to see on page 95, week 3 of Lent, Monday, you're going to see three readings, one from Genesis, one from 1 Corinthians, one from Mark. And then above that line, you're going to see the number 80, and then a symbol, and then the, the number 77 and 79. Now those are the Psalms for the day. And the ones on the left side of the symbol are for morning prayer, and the ones on the right side of the symbol are for evening prayer. So we're just doing morning prayer this morning, so we're going to do Psalm 80. Now, scraps of paper are really helpful, or post-it notes for your prayer book when you're doing morning prayer. So I see Psalm 80. I'm going to go ahead and mark it in my prayer book. So there it is, Psalm 80. I went ahead and marked it so I can turn to it when we're ready to do our morning prayer. Going back to page 955, you'll see there's, like I said, there's three readings. And the way I'm going to do it this morning, the way I recommend that you do it, is that if you're going to do morning prayer, do the Genesis reading and also do the Mark reading. The Genesis reading and the Mark reading. And then you go over... And you grab your Bible, and you go ahead and mark those with a, with a ribbon like I've got here, um, or a little scrap of paper, or a post-it note. And then you can go ahead and just put your books out right in front of you so you're ready to go and you're not fumbling around a ton when you actually do your prayers. Okay, so let's dive right into it. You're going to turn to page 75 in the prayer book, and that's Daily Morning Prayer Right 2. And you're going to see in the beginning that, that the prayer starts with some sentences of Scripture. We're going to flip to Lent, because that's the season that we're in, and you can pick any one of these sentences of Scripture to start. Before we start our prayers, it's good to take a breath. Maybe keep some silence and open our heart to God. I've been saying the top sentence a lot recently, so I'm going to go with the second one, which is from the prophet Joel. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love 
and repents of evil. And then you turn the page to page 79, and then you go straight into the confession of sins. If I'm doing it by myself, I skip the bits that say, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, and I just go straight in. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Turning to page 180 is the what we might call the absolution. Now, this is something a lot of people don't know, but it's really kind of cool and important. In church, this would be the part where the priest might raise their hand or do like this and pronounce God's forgiveness. But the forgiveness that we have is given to us by Christ, by his, by his sacrifice, by his redemption on the cross. So anyone can declare that. So if you were doing it at home, instead of standing up and doing this, you can say it yourself. And where it says you here, you can just substitute our. So you could say, Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Okay, the next bit is a little confusing. These are antiphons for the invitatory, which is a hilarious phrase to say, antiphons for the invitatory. I would skip ahead to page 82. And these are some songs from the tradition, the history of the church that have been in morning prayer for a very long time, and we kind of rotate them in and out seasonally. Psalm 95 is one of the big theme psalms of Lent, so Psalm 95 is the one you're going to want to use at this point for your morning prayers for the next 21 days. And usually, I um, even with I'm by myself, if I'm up early and I don't want to wake the house up, I'll sing this song quietly. If I'm doing this in church, I'll sing it loudly. Um, but you can kind of do whatever you we want to do. I'll just say it today. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the ca caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. If you turn to page 84, you'll see the psalm or psalms appointed for today, and that's Psalm 80 that we saw earlier. So what I would do is take my scrap of paper, hold my place at page 84, and then flip to where I've saved Psalm 80, which is going to be on page 702 of the prayer book, page 702. If you're doing it with more than one person, you can alternate verses. Somebody takes the first and then everybody else takes the second. If you got three or four people, you can just kind of go around the room. But it's fun to vary it, it up and get everybody's voices involved. Hero shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth you that are enthroned upon the cherubim. In the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angered, despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. 
You prepared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven, behold and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. They burn it with fire like rubbish. At the rebuke of your countenance, let them perish. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand. The son of man you have made strong, so strong for yourself. And so we will never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance and we shall be saved. And then you flip back to page 84, and after you do the psalm, you say what we call the Gloria Patri, or just the Gloria, and that's the little prayer at the top of 84. And you'll see a lot of people who will bow their heads or do a little reverence at the name of the Trinity. You don't have to do that but it's kind of a nice practice and I like doing it. The reason somebody might bow or reverence when we're in prayer is so that we're not a stiff-necked people. That's a refrain throughout the Old Testament. And what that means is people who are too busy or are too proud or don't want to bow their head in prayer. And so we do that so that we're not a stiff-necked people because um, we don't want to be a stiff-necked, non-worshiping people. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So you do that right after the psalm. And then you'll see also on 84, it has the lessons. And those are the lessons that we talked about that are assigned for the day in the daily office lectionary. So you've already got those saved in your Bible. I usually forget which one it is, so I have to flip back to the lectionary. And it's Genesis 44, 18 through 34. Genesis 44, 18 through 34. Then Judah went up to him and said, O my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ear. And let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, Go again, buy us a little food, we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down. For we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, Surely he has been torn to pieces, and I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to you, you will bring down my gray hairs to evil and Sheol. Now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die, and your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with, the, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If you do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. The word of the Lord. It's probably a little, not a little, a lot confusing 
just jumping right into the story. Part of the fun of the Daily Office is you get to follow along with the stories of the Bible, and you get to learn a lot about the, some of the passages that don't come up much on Sunday that um, we don't know much about. This is in the, the middle of the Joseph saga. I remember Joseph was annoying, so his brothers were going to kill him, and they sold him into slavery, yada, yada, yada. He became a big deal in Egypt. Pharaoh um, is, takes him on as his right-hand man. There's a famine across the land. His no good brothers come down begging for food. Oh, they want to buy food, but asking for food in Egypt. And then Joseph messes with them pretty harshly for several chapters before ultimately forgiving him. One of the coolest things about Genesis is that the patriarchs, our ancestors in faith, are far from perfect. They are like fully saint and sinner in these pages. And like I said, that's kind of the fun of this thing is to is to learn the stories. Uh, for the first time or again, and the Joseph saga, once you get into it, is a pretty ripping yarn. Okay, so if this were Sunday morning, we would have a canticle that the choir would sing or a cantor would sing or we'd say together between the readings, but since we're doing this for home worship this morning, I'm just going to go straight from this reading into the next reading. You could keep some silence. That would be cool. You could journal about it. You could talk about it amongst your family if you wanted to do that, um, but since it's just me, I'm going to go straight into the next reading. And the next reading is Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's, ha the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people wailing, weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, rise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was twelve years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So I didn't know that was the reading for today, and it's pretty powerful given everything that's going on. A couple things that I just can't help talking about this because I'm a preacher and you know how it goes. But something we might miss is that this is a story um, about unlikely people coming to Jesus out of desperation and need. So at this point, Jesus is not in the mainstream. He's sort of a um, he's doing something new, something quite interesting. So the fact that the ruler of the synagogue comes to Jesus for help is a big deal. 
And then Mark juxtaposes that with a woman who is um, in a desperate position and is not doesn't have power, unlike the ruler of the synagogue, and she's healed by Jesus as well. So what what we're being told here is that Jesus is going to heal the powerful and the wealthy, and he's going to heal the sick and the poor. And something else interesting, at this time and place, men and women didn't touch each other. Um, unrelated, un, unmarried men and women didn't touch each other. So the fact that, that she's just come up and grabbed Jesus by the, by, by the hem of his garment is points to the desperation and the fact that Jesus wheels around and as a rabbi or respected person, he doesn't criticize her, but in fact he honors and highlights her faith is, uh, is, really, is really beautiful. So I don't plan to preach, didn't plan to preach long on that, but there's a lot going on in this passage. Um, okay, so again, you can, you can pause after that and you can have some conversation if you're with other people um, or you can move on to the next part of our worship. Okay, you're going to turn back to morning prayer. You're going to skip past all the canticles that we would use on a Sunday morning. And then you're going to turn to page 96, and you're going to say the Apostles' Creed. You'll see here the rubric says standing. That's At home, you know, you can kneel, you can sit. Um, it's a more contemplative setting, so you don't have to follow all the postures. Everybody would say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Continuing on page 97. I like to say the other translation, uh, the more modern translation of, of the Lord's Prayer during the daily office, because it just it breaks it up for me and I listen to the words a little more. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. If somebody was with me, I would do the suffrages. You can pick either A or B, but since it's just me, I'm going to skip them. Then you go to the colics of the day, and these are some of the most beautiful prayers in our prayer book. I find that these prayers are written on my heart after saying them for a few years and are some of the most powerful, some of the most comforting prayers available to us. The beautiful thing about these prayers, when you when you pray them regularly or seasonally, because I definitely don't, don't pray them all the time. I do it a lot occasionally. But when you do that, even like that, they form the mental furniture of your mind. So when you go to pray, their pray, their your prayer, your words are shaped by these traditional, by these ancient prayers. So uh, really, when I get to this point in the service, it's kind of it's all blessing at this point because these colics are so powerful to me. You don't have to do this. This is just this is just my own practice. If I'm praying on a Monday, I usually start with a colic for the renewal of life. On page 99. O God the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, turning the page, you say one of the prayers for mission, there's two at the bottom of 100 and then another at the top of 101. You say one of those three prayers. I'm going to say the first one on page 100. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you 
through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this point, you can pray extemporaneously. You can pray silently, or you can pray aloud, or you can do a little bit of both. I usually do a little bit of both. So feel free at this point to offer your own prayers. Lord, thank you for this way of being together in prayer. I ask for your healing for all who are sick. Lord, I know that you will, that will be with and will guide and comfort all those who do the work that we depend on the medical professionals, the support staff, people who work in the grocery business, uh, suppliers, people who work for power companies, people who cannot take off because our whole lives depends on what they do. Lord, please help me to be open to your spirit. Open my mind to the work that you have prepared for me to do and for us to do as a church. Amen. And then I would say the general thanksgiving. If you're doing it with folks, everybody can join in on this. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Then you can continue on page 102 and say the prayer of St. Chrysostom. I usually don't say it when I'm by myself because it says whenever two or three are gathered, quote from the Gospels. It's perfectly fine to do, but it just seems kind of silly when it's just me. And then I would say, let us bless the Lord, thanks be to God, and then one of the final bits of scripture which function as a blessing on page 102. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church, and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Guys, thank y'all for listening. Please uh, call me, email me, text me if you need anything, if you want to talk, if you want to pray, if you want some more pointers on how to do morning prayer. My schedule is really opened up this next week, so I'm here for you however I, however I can be. We are, uh, we're not going to post a video uh, every day, although we're going to try to post something on Twitter or Facebook about the 21 days of morning prayer, but we're working on trying to do other online stuff and to keep you in prayer and study uh, over the days to come. Um, again, thank you for the, um, the emails and the texts and the um, really like massive outpouring of, uh, of, of love and support for, uh, for, for us just trying to be the church in this period um, of time. And um, like I said, let us know if you need anything and um, go in peace.